Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Chixen Mihai. I'm the co director of the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion. And on behalf of the other directors, Jonathan Sheehan and Susanna Elm, I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture. Um, I also want to plug uh, later this month, we have Vina Das, uh, professor of anthropology at John Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins, and author with Stanley Cavell of Life and Words Violence and Descent into the Ordinary. She'll be de delivering the annual lecture on religious tolerance on Tuesday, February 23rd at 5 in the Maud Fife Room. That'll be called More Than Religious Tolerance, Self Other, and Mysteries of Erotics. And also, uh, 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 Professor Das will be giving a colloquium the next day, Wednesday, February 24th, from 4 to 6 here in Dwinell. And that will be on Of Mistakes, Errors, and Superstition. Wittgenstein's remarks on Fraser, and there's a reading for that, and you have to sign up for it. So you can go to our website and, and get that, and if you register for it, uh, it should be a really interesting experience. Um, today I have the pleasure to introduce Noreen Kawaja and uh, also Ron Hasner of Berkeley's Political Science Department, who has agreed to uh, provide a response very generously. Um, most of you already know Dr. Hasner. Uh, for those who don't, Ron is the author of Religion, in the Military Worldwide and War on Sacred Grounds, has received four major teaching awards, and together with Stephen Fish, co-directs Berkeley's Religion and Politics program. Our speaker today, Noreen Kawaja, joins us from Yale University's Religious Studies Department, uh, where she's been teaching since 2012, the same year she received her doctorate from Stanford which is a well-regarded university in Santa Clara County. <laughs> Her dissertation focused on the concepts of conversion and authenticity in Kierkegaard and Heidegger, a set of interests that metamorphosed into a book, The Religion of Existence, Asceticism in Philosophy from Kierkegaard to Sartre, that will come out from University of Chicago Press later this year. She describes one goal of this project as by showing the way in which the philosophies of Heidegger and Sartre appropriate tacitly ascetic ideals about spiritual self-formation while criticizing the metaphysics on which these ideals traditionally stood, I present existentialism as a complex and original experiment in secular translation. Dr. Kwaja has also published widely and deeply on these same thinkers and on more recent figures like Karl Loeth, Jacques Collette, and even on the Taoist classic Zhuangzi. Today, though, she'll be examining the cultural and religious background of the Danish cartoon crisis in her talk, Theology and Danish Politics of Offense. Please welcome Dr. Kowat. Does that sound okay to everybody? All right. Thank you, uh, Mark, for that really lovely introduction. And um, thanks for the invitation and to, to the center as well. It's really an honor to be here, not only in the long history of uh, speaking about issues of free speech at Berkeley, but also in the shorter term. Um, it was uh, an, a kind of a 2009 publication is Critique Secular, which came out from the Townsend Center of the Humanities based on a conference here, um, which a number of wonderful Berkeley faculty contributed that got me thinking about this issue. So. Um, so it's really, really exciting for me to, to be here today to talk to you um, about, about the cartoons. Okay, so we begin. So in, in September of 2005, Denmark's most popular daily paper, Jyvansposten, published a set of cartoons, this is not an image from that, um, designed by different artists, caricaturing the Prophet Muhammad. Some of the cartoons mocked the assignment itself, as provocational journalism and nothing more. Others were more brazen. Kurt Westergaard's cartoon in particular became the center of attention. It depicted the prophet as a terrorist showing him in a kind of turban with a bomb tucked inside. For many in the international media, it was the reaction to these cartoons in the so-called Muslim world, which served as the beginning of the story. But in fact, the question of where this story actually began was the crucial point. Did it begin with the editorial decision to publish the cartoons? with the delegation of Danish imams who had traveled to Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Qatar, in an effort to make the situation of Muslims in Denmark better known and to gain support for their protests? Did it begin with the European and American media outlets, which seemed primed to initiate 
a kind of showdown na a narrative at every turn. And uh, I found that, in fact, in, a number, in the large number of articles and books that have been published about the cartoons crisis as it's come to have been known, a chronology actually features as one of the primary analytic contributions of each of these works. That is, they're disputing where and how to tell the story and what the beginning and the nodes are. So, in the editorial that accompanied the cartoons themselves, the culture editor of Jelandsposten, Fleming Rosa, offered the following comment. Modern, secular, sorry, that's not in here, secular society is rejected by some Muslims, I'm quoting. They lay claim to a special position when they insist on special consideration of their own religious feelings. This insistence is incompatible with secular democracy and freedom of speech where one must be ready to put up with insults, mockery, and ridicule. So this accompanied the initial publication of the cartoons. It was next to the text. And as many have pointed out, the defensive character of these remarks indicates a peculiar temporality. The cartoons were no random exercise in religious satire. They were commissioned in the context of already circulating, circulating rumors that Danish newspapers were pulling or rejecting certain stories about Islam for fear of Muslims' reaction. In February of 2006, when the controversy had reached its maximally global pitch, Rosa, the editor, wrote another editorial in the paper explaining that the cartoons were not an attempt to ostracize the Muslim population in Denmark, but were rather intended, quote, as a means of integrating them, his words, by initiating them into the Danish, quote, tradition of satire. Similarly, Rosa describes the initial decision in a, different, in a diff slightly different turn in his 2011 monograph on the subject, The Tyranny of Silence. He says, publishing the cartoons was a kind of test. I was, quote, prompted by my perception of the self-censorship by the European media, end quote. This nod to European media is typical. At every turn, Rosa seeks to cast the issues at stake in the crisis as a European a set of issues, or even global set of issues. The debate, he insists, is not about the place or situation of Muslims in Denmark, um, but about the conflict, a, glo a global conflict of values. What norms operate when the general freedom of speech and religious feelings in particular contexts? collide. Of course, editorial director or not, Rose's interpretation is just that, one person's interpretation of events. But his remarks, taken together, offer us a glimpse into some of the central ambiguities at the heart of this saga. And notably, I, I, as I was sort of pouring through the, 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 the large number of, of uh, articles that have been written about it, there seem to be three sorts of defenses that circle through both Rose's discourse and a lot of discourse about these events. Um, defenses that stand up to the publication of the cartoons. So here we go. So this is my distillation of them. First one is democratic society protects the legal right to freedom of speech under almost all conditions, even if it is offensive or injurious or even morally reprehensible. A second sort of tack that is taken is that beyond a legal issue, it's actually morally beneficial to Islam that it should endure criticism and of which offense is a kind of necessary or inevitable element. And that may be because there are two sorts of subversions of that second argument. One is it's, um, it is intrinsically beneficial to Islam or any religion to undergo critique, or more along the lines of Rose's claim that it's just how we do things in the Western world, so this is beneficial to Islam because it helps them to integrate into our culture. And the third is we're an equal opportunity ironizing culture. It would perhaps be morally reprehensible and perhaps even legally problematic if we were targeting Muslims in particular. But this is actually just about mocking sacred things, and we do that to everyone. So the stakes, I think, of such arguments are confusing. The first neatly brackets distinctions between the speech itself, what the speech means to the listener, and the reason why the speaker uttered it, indifferent. The second justifies itself because of what it means to the listener, but ignores why the speaker uttered it. And the third tacitly accepts that an intention to offend would or might be problematic if it were targeted only at one group in particular. These ambiguities, that is, the ambiguities of our own criteria about what kinds of offensive matter and on what terms they matter, become even more difficult to sort out when the we is so unstable. Is it in the name of Danish culture or enlightenment values, secularism, or democracy? Looking at, back on the Danish cartoons from our present moment, which is nearly 10 years later, it's difficult not to see them as one event in a kind of long chain of Euro-Islamic conflicts from the Rushdie affair to the attacks on Charlie Hebdo. 
Though we may appreciate that the actors are very different in all of these cases, that Rushdie and Rosa are not on the same team, this is actually an alliance that Rosa continually tries to make, is that he's a kind of in, uh, on following up on the Rushdie affair. There is nonetheless a kind of gravitational pull between these episodes and the discourse surrounding them in our own cultural imagination. The Danish case, I would like to argue today, is importantly different. One of the most important ways in which it is different is the way in which Christianity plays a role in the critical culture of modern Denmark. And since we're talking about Christ Denmark, by Christianity, I mean Lutheran Christianity. So, a few words about religion in Denmark. Religion, uh, Denmark has a long-standing reputation, like many of its Nordic neighbors, for being an extremely secular country. Sociologists continue to define it as one of the most secular and even irreligious countries in the world, citing statistics which describe that up to three quarters of the population do not answer yes to the question of whether they believe in God, and that about 2%, perhaps even less, of the population uh, attends, and yet uh, about 2% of the population attends church on a weekly basis. The situation was at such a point that in 2012, uh, a Jutlandish paper advertising a job opening for a local pastor included in the listed requirements for the position that the pastor should please believe in God. <laughs> there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a very funny controversy surrounding this, uh, surrounding this notice. So, there are problems with this secularist picture, of course. First of all, Denmark has a state church, funded by lots and lots of taxes. In 2012, the Church of Denmark had about 80% of the country's membership. And of course, there are different ways uh, to read the relation between church attendance and religious participation or religiousness. Rather than focusing on weekly attendance, another metric might show a quite high and stable use of the, use of, of the church for life events, big life events, like baptism, confirmation, funerals, and to a lesser extent these days, weddings. What's more, many have argued that the welfare state, which has become one of the most potent symbols of Danish identity since the Second World War, is historically and institutionally entwined with the Danish folk church. As one editorial put it in a Danish uh, uh, sort of tabloid paper in 2006, it can be argued that the particular Danish uh, welfare state is an expression of Christianity, having permeated every corner of society, daily life, and social life. We Christians without we are Christians without saying we are Christians, and almost without going to church. In what follows, I'm going to suggest a way to think about the religion at work in this ostensibly secular, unbelieving land. And I'm not going to draw out the religious aspects of the welfare state, nor will I try to rethink tax, the tax and attendance numbers, which I think others can do a lot better than I can. Rather, I'm going to focus on some of the explicitly theological components of modern Danish political culture, with particular focus on the relation between Lutheran Christianity, Danish secularism, and the culture of religious critique. With any luck, I hope that this may reset what it might mean to think about Denmark as a secular country and give us a different picture of the stakes, particularly of religious offense in Danish public discourse. So, I start here. Tidevær, I'm not saying it totally right, but it will have to do. Springs from a will to confrontation. And Tidevær is this will to confrontation to confront unconditionally, radically, each and every person, regardless of whether he is friend or foe. As long as this will to confrontation lives, Tita Verv lives if the confrontation finish, finishes, or if some circle of friends is excluded, then it too ceases to exist. So what are we looking at here? A statement about Tita Verv. And what is that? It is a radical theological movement centered around a journal of the same name founded in 1926 in Denmark, which is often described, and it's often described as a kind of Danish analog of the dialectical theological movement occurring in Germanophone areas after World War I. And in the Germanic uh, countries, the, this movement was associated with the likes of Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, and Rudolf Bultmann. There is a sympathy there between these two movements, the German and the Danish, notable, notable first of all from the title. Spring, uh, translates to turn of time, or less literally new era, or epoch. The periodical associated with the dialectical theological journal in, German, in the German, conce German context, Zwischen die Zeiten, Between the Times, was started three years before and was very widely read in Germany and Protestant Europe. At the same time, I think, it would be a mistake to conceive of the movement itself as a kind of import, or even to think of it too closely on the German model. One of the conventional ways of narrating the beginning of dialectical theology in Germany, it's also called the theology of crisis, and that, that echo of crisis and critique in this movement is important to think about. 
Uh, so one of the conventional ways of narrating its beginning in Germany is by reference to the influence of Søren Kierkegaard on Karl, ba on Karl Barth's famed commentary, The Epistle to the Romans. In between the first edition of Barth's text, which in 1919, which was a relatively unoriginal reform reading of Paul, made very little impact on the theological world, and the second edition in 1922, which was by contrast a kind of gripping ascetic manifesto, um, rejecting all forms of uh, what he called a religion of culture. In between these two editions, Barth, according to his own description of events, discovered Kierkegaard. The 19th century Danish thinker became a model for the work that Christian asceticism could do within the bourgeois liberal Christianity of modern German culture. In a 1966 volume on Danish theology directed at um, German dialectical theologians, the editors explain Tidefer's distinctness to the German audience. First, they point out, it does not simply take place in the atmosphere of academic theology of Kierkegaard research. In fact, it also has to do with a public debate about the church and about the folk schools. The journal, Tidefer, plays in a prominent role in all of this. It's no, in no way a narrow disciplinary journal in theology, but neither is it exactly a church bladder in the, in the, in the German tradition. Rather, from its beginnings after the First World War until now, it's a polemic of the folk church, which is the public or state church, um, which uh, doesn't exist in Germany, obviously, in the same way that it exists in Denmark. It's a literary corrective, completely in the tone and manner of Kierkegaard, only in a completely different context. It is supervised by a small and uh, utterly independent editorial circle maintained by a relatively small number, but very widely, widely read. It's aggressive and also feared journal aimed at the laziness within existing Christendom. So the first thing to note is that in forming a dialectical movement of their own ready to take on the formidable force of cultural Christianity in Denmark, Danish theologians did truly conceive of it as their own project. Kierkegaard, after all, was one of their own. He had startled, started the battle with secularized Christian culture himself, most notably directed in his time at the ideas of Nikolai Grundtvig a pastor, a contemporary of Kierkegaard's with an enormous influence on Danish culture who advocated a popular folk identity and a Christianity to serve it. His most state, Grundtvig's most uh, famous statement about himself perhaps, which encapsulates everything Kierkegaard sought to protest, Danish first, Christian second. The opposition between Kierkegaard and Grundtvig is one of the basic tropes of Danish religious history. Grundtvig remains lesser known outside of Scandinavia, but is considered to be the single most important formulator of modern Danish populism. His hymns are used in the state church, his educational thought helped set off Denmark's modern reforms in populist high school, and he's also cited as a key ideological source for the Danish welfare state. In shortest form, their conflict, the conflict between these two, tends to be summarized in the following terms. For Grundtvig, humanity is an expression of the divine. There is a unity of nature that allows a religious valuation of the human qua human. For Kierkegaard, by contrast, there's an absolute difference between the human and the divine. Human, humanism and asceticism, asceticism and humanism, this is the unresolved tension between these two figures and in Lutheranism, Lutheranism itself. Insofar as dialectical theology takes up the ascetic position of this infinite difference, the confrontation between the human and divine nature, we might expect Tidefer to oppose the nationalistic Christianity of Grundtvig and the folk church. It did begin that way in the interwar period. But then we must also keep in mind that from 1940, when the German occupation came to Denmark, the nationalistic elements of Danish Christianity and the ascetic elements of Danish Christianity were able to work together in a new way. During the occupation, Tidefer became an important rallying point, and it, which made this dialectical theology in Denmark in very much in contrast with its German counterpart, also a catalyst for nationalist sentiment. Further unlike the German dialectical movement, whose journal stopped in the 30s, and influence stopped being help, felt more or less in the generation after the Second World War, Tidefer is still going. It maintains a website with its entire archive, as well as with the newer issues, and in the period following 2006, it published many defenses of Wieland's Posten's decision to publish the cartoon. On the one hand, they were just one voice among many in the sea of reaction to the cartoons, and at the same time, two of the leading figures within the movement, uh, Jesper Langbala and the editor of the journal itself, Søren Kraro, were who are both also Lutheran pastors, were also members of parliament during this period, elected in 2001 as representatives tied with the Danske Folkeparti, to the Danish People's Party, um, 
the, the People's Party was founded in 1995 as a successor to the even more right-wing Progress Party. It's now described as conservative, either right or far right in Danish terms, and promotes Danish culture as a monoculture. A lot of its agenda in recent years is about opposing immigration and opposing EU integration. And the two, 2001 elections in which uh, both Kraurup and Langbala were elected represented a big gain for the, D, uh, for the DFP, but, but in fact it continues to be the fastest growing party in Denmark and uh, currently the second visit biggest, with its biggest gains to date in the 2015 elections. So during the debate that followed the publication of the cartoons, um, the movement had a considerable impact on the political conversation and on the party more generally. And the, and the Danish People's Party was generally considered to be responsible for holding the parliament and for the prime minister to the right uh, during this period. Uh, some even speculated that the prime minister at the time of the publication of the cartoons, Anders Borg Rasmussen, his much speculated, his much discussed refusal to apologize in the wake of the cartoons. Some, some speculated that that uh, was a sign of the influence uh, of, the, of, of the far right on him. So what I've been talking about, priests in the parliament, is the overt presence of religion in Danish politics. And it didn't go unnoticed. Many on the left feared a compromise in Danish secularism, which uh, as a tradition they were as proud of as the welfare state. But note the comments of Pia Kjærsgaard, who's the founder of the Danish People's Party and was head of the party during uh, the period in question. She's now Speaker of the House. Um, so uh, I took these, these comments from uh, the party's own website. She, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short article called The Black Priests. Um, we do not even consider Soren Krarup and Jesper Langbala as exceptions. They are members of parliament on precisely equal footing with all the others. And Kjærsgaard goes on to, no, uh, to a very humanizing characterization of the two, referring to their, quote, friendly, civilized, polite, generous qualities, to the fact that they have a sense of humor, that they enjoy red wine, cigars, and to Langbala in particular's love for dancing. She then concludes with an account of them as exemplary me members of the democratic unit, uh, Soren Krarup and Jesper Langbala love to debate all possible and impossible topics, often fiercely, boomingly, and long into the wee hours. Since they do not know discretion, schemes, or tactics, they are completely indifferent to who is listening. Um, they say what they say, the doors are open, they can be irritating and infuriating when they work themselves up to be sure, but they are never in any way boring and they're 100% loyal. So the message that Kierkegaard wanted to send uh, to the left here, is that there's nothing extraordinary about these pastors, either as Danes, they like all of the same things the rest of us like, or as politicians, they are as committed to democracy as any of us. But to believe her, to be convinced by this account, is not only to understand something about these two particular pastors, but about the norm to which they're being compared. If two Orthodox Lutheran pastors in Parliament means business as usual for Danish politics, in all of the respects which count with for, which for Kjærsgaard is socialization, then this is perhaps as great an indicator as we can ask for about the problematic line between the secular and the religious in the Danish political context to begin with. I think we can even call it an investment in indifference, in the indifference between the Christian and the Danish elements of the public sphere. And I'll try to back that up in what follows. So see for an example, this is a, a 2011 ad for the Danish People's Party, which I found on YouTube, and um, I'm not going to play but I will sort of uh, read for you. So it, it reads, I am Denmark. I am the oldest kingdom in the world. My flag is the oldest of all the nations. My language and my people have been supporting pillars for our country for over a thousand years. My people have always cultivated the land and fished the seas. I have survived through countless wars and changing times. Large areas of land were taken from me. And there's uh, this map changes at that point uh, and, and it shows the loss of land. Um, uh, large areas of land were taken from me. Despite this, I survived. I am Denmark. I am a country of literature. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I'm a country of literature, poetry, science, and philosophy. And uh, then sort of four pictures flash before the screen. Literature, they, they show a picture of Hans Christian Andersen, science, a picture of Tycho Brahe, the astronomer. And uh, for uh, um, poetry and philosophy, we have a picture on the left of Nikolai Grundtvig, poetry, and Soren Kierkegaard, philosophy. So uh, to call, uh, and so I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. There's a, another interesting little uh, moment in the, in the ad. So my core values, the next line is, um, the down button, 
the core values are uh, democracy, tolerance, that's the image they're showing, tolerance, and freedom of speech. So that's the symbol of freedom of speech. Okay, so back to, to Grundtvig and Kierkegaard. To call Grundtvig a poet and Kierkegaard a philosopher is very strange. It, it's a bit like calling Obama a journalist. Um, he wrote things that are in the papers, it's sure, but it's beside the point. It's not the center of power nor the center of influence. And I'm taking this uh, representation of, uh, of the two as kind of emblematically secular, right? So this indifference, this is what I'm calling an indifference to the distinction between Danishness and Christianness, is in fact something we can think of as typical of a certain strain of Luth Lutheranism. It's in fact one version of doctrinaire Lutheranism. And uh, in 1999, Tidevert, the publishing house now, I mean, which is, belongs to the movement, issued for the first time a Danish translation of uh, three polemical essays of Luther's on the war against the Turk, the sermon against the Turk, and on the Jews and their lives. Now, these three essays do not naturally belong together. They belong together only in the guise of this uh, 1999 edition, Against the Turk and the Jews, and the Jew, and uh, it was reissued uh, into a second edition in 2012. Now, the selection of these three texts was not a distant or critical one. That is to say, it wasn't a question of, okay, here's look, look at the dangerous politics into which our beloved Lutheranism can get us. For all we hear about the Dane's love of satire, this publication seems to have been enti made entirely sincerely. So I want us just to look at a few passages from the first of these essay essays, Luther's 1529 on the war against the Turk. The essay itself represents a shift in Luther's position vis-a-vis -vis Islam and the Turkish invasion, which was approaching ever closer to the center uh, of Prussia. And uh, earlier he recommended utter passivity. He, that is to say, he had recommended that Christians do nothing in the face of this invasion. invasion. Here he qualifies that argument. So, since they, therefore they wanted to be Christians, that is those who wanted to oppose the invasion, sorry that this is very small, nay, the best Christians in the world, in fact, and yet fight against the Turk, endure no evil and suffer neither compulsion nor wrong, I oppose them with this saying of Christ, that Christians shall not resist evil, but suffer all things and let all things go. It did not please me either that the Christians and the princes were driven, urged, and irritated into attacking the Turk and making war on him before they amended their own ways and lived like true Christians. But, he continues, what moved me most of all was this. They undertook to fight against the Turk under the name of Christ and taught men and stirred them up to do this as though our people were an army of Christians against the Turks who were enemies of Christ. And this is straight against Christ's doctrine and name. It's against his doctrine because he says that Christians shall not resist evil, shall not fight or quarrel, etc. A bit further on, he continues, in the first place, if there is to be a war against the Turk, it should be fought at the emperor's command, under his banner and in his name. Then everyone can assure his own conscience that he is obeying the, obeying the ordinance of God, since we know that the emperor is our true overlord and head, and he who obeys him in such a case obeys God also. Continues a little bit. The emperor is not the head of Christendom or the protector of the gospel or of the faith. In the second place, finally, the Turk's Quran or creed teaches him to destroy not only the Christian faith, but also the whole temporal government. Weltlicher, the word is, it's also secular. It's the other way you can translate it. World, uh, secular government. His Muhammad, as has been said, com commands that ruling is to be done by the sword, and in his Quran, the sword is the commonest and noblest work. <laughs> a lot to say about these passages. Um, I'll say just one thing, that there's a basic tension in this vision. And I'm, I, I, and I'm only actually really rehearsing <coughs> centuries of worried Lutherans trying to make sense of it. Um, but, but it has bearing on the Danish case. So Christianity, on the one hand, is all suffering and letting go. When we fight the Turk, we fight not as Christians, but out of our obedience to secular authority. Secular authority, however, is divinely appointed and established by God's ordinance. And still more precariously, this secular authority is not protecting Christianity or faith when it defends us against the Turk. This carefully balanced tension makes possible a crucial distinction. It is only as secularists that the citizen of Christendom may resist the Turk. The Christian is not fighting a religious war. Only for the Turk is the war a religious one. And Luther goes on to make 
uh, this point even more explicitly in later passages from the essay, criticizing the paltry religion of the Turk, which allows him to chant Allahu Akbar on the battlefield. In a sense, the opposition between Brunfi and Kirhuar, which I referred to earlier, and which, to which countless books and articles and dissertations in, have been offered in Denmark, is one way of representing precisely this tension. That is to say, it's an argument about human and divine, that is to say, the argument about human and divine natures is also an argument about whether and under what con conditions the human world is to be charged with religious value. So in uh, what remains of, uh, of the paper, I'm going to take a slightly different turn, and we're going to go into the work of Kierkegaard himself, because um, I think there, there, uh, there is a, um, a way in which we can see through one of his uh, really quite influential and, and interesting texts how the secular can become the site and the premise of a very extreme form of ascetic Lutheranism uh, that works its way out into some of these conversations. So in what follows, we're going to have a little bit of a reading and interpretation from uh, Kierkegaard's aesthetic masterpiece, Training in Christianity. So written in 1849, published in 1850, um, the work uh, was composed right around the time when, in 1849, uh, King Frederick VII signed Denmark's first constitution, which established uh, the first parliamentary democracy, and among other things, the Lutheran Church of Denmark as the state church. Kierkegaard's position in this fiery work represents his most serious positive articulation of Christianity in his later authorship. It can be seen kind of in, a, in a way as the intellectual backbone of his later quite famous polemical writings against the state church and its ma major proponents, which have been collected under the title Attack on Christendom. Part two in particular um, of, of this work uh, is what I'll focus on which, uh, as you see there, begins with this quotation from Matthew, blessed is he who, whosoever is not offended in me, which is really uh, a long exposition on the centrality of the idea of offense in Christian thought. Okay, so Kierkegaard's basic claim, Christ, the figure of Christ, is intrinsically, essentially offensive. Kierkegaard will claim that this offense operates in two dimensions. First is the offense of loftiness. That is to say, Christ is just a human person who is at the same time God. He is, quote, just a man, and at the same time, he is the God of all men. An individual man who speaks or acts as though he were God, or who allows such an impression to emerge through his conduct, invites his fellow men to be offended. This is the first sense of offense. Second, the sort of man that the Christian God is, is not a glorious or noble man. He's a servant who lives a life of abjection and misery. This God suffers just as much and just as though he were um, a merely mortal being. This is the offense of lowliness. In the first sort of offense, at issue is the elevation of a single ordinary man. In the second, the abasement of God by being made to suffer and serve. Together, these two dimensions ensure that offense is absolutely essential to the effect of Christ on the human mind. And I quote, the possibility of offense accompanies the God-man at every instant. Recognizing that Christ is intrinsically offensive is not blasphemous for Kierkegaard. On the contrary, it's the sole foundation of true faith. Quote, the possibility of offense is just the repellent force by which faith comes into existence. If one does not choose, that is, instead, to be offended. So with the God-man, the possibility of offense is present at every instance and is, quote, the stumbling block for all. Offense and stumbling block, block. These are New Testament words. In the New Testament, they tend to point outward. They articulate the relation between Christianity and the world. Christ is not a stumbling block for everyone. According to Paul, he's offensive for the Jews and the Greeks. And conversely, as Matthew has it, blessed is he who is not offended in me. In expounding this line from Matthew, which guides the section, Kierkegaard makes a distinction that dramatically changes the role that offense plays in Christian experience. Offense may itself be bad, blessed is he who is not offended, but the possibility of offense, however, is essential to any true Christian faith. A, a passage very similar to the one that's in front of you, the possibility of offense 
is the crossways from which a man turns either to offense on the one hand or to faith, faith on the other. In other words, to have faith is nothing else than to recognize that Christ is the offense and to choose, nonetheless, not to be offended. But what can it mean to recognize only the possibility of offense? To recognize something as capable of, of offending can only be rigorously separated from the feeling of offense if one is considering the matter abstractly or in relationship to another. So I can see that this, this, this claim that this man over there is God might offend other people, for example, the Jews, but I myself am not offended because I have faith that it is so, something like this. But this cannot be what Kierkegaard means by distinguishing possibility from actuality. For him, faith is an eminently and essentially subjective relationship. If recognizing the possibility of offense is part of faith, then it must be that an offense is actually one is, that is pos that this offense is one that is actually possible for me. And in this way, the category of the Jew becomes something other, that is, he's a, the idea that uh, Christ is offensive to the Jews, becomes something other than a figure of alterity. Through this theolo theology of offense, the Jew becomes reconstituted as a kind of pathological universal. If the moderns are to become Christians in this particular theological picture, they must first feel Christ's offensiveness, and this means to feel it as though they were Jews. What distinguishes the Christian from the Jew, however, is that for the Christian, Christ is also a sign, the sign of contradiction, Kierkegaard writes. To explain this phrase, the sign of contradiction, Kierkegaard first gives us the example of a nautical mark. Quote, immediately, a nautical mark is a post, a light, some such thing. But a sign, it isn't immediately strange inverted in grammatical order. A sign is what it is only as a qualification of reflection. So to be a sign is to be besides what one is immediately, that is this material wood or post, right? But besides what one immediately is, also some other thing. And a sign of contradiction, which is how he describes Christ, is even more distinct from an ordinary sign. Its immediate meaning, which is human being, and its reflective signification, God, stand in an unresolvable conflict. A sign of contradiction is one which draws attention to itself, and then when attention is fixed upon it, shows that it contains a contradiction. Thus what the sign of contradiction is uniquely able to inspire is an enigmatic and countervailing action, attraction and repulsion, repulsion and attraction. It draws you in and then it repels. This much, the Jew, quotation marks, might readily admit. What we still do not understand is why it matters. And it's here that Kierkegaard's argument takes a striking turn. The sign of contradiction is important because its way of holding one captive in nonsense or absurdity actually creates the conditions for an entirely different form of knowledge. The God-man, quote, makes it impossible for one to desist from looking. And lo, while one looks, one sees as in a mirror one gets to see oneself. Here it is contradiction itself that creates the condition for meaning. A contradiction placed directly in front of a man, if only one can get him to look upon it, is a mirror. And while he is judging, what dwells within him must be revealed. It is a riddle, but while he is guessing, what dwells within him is revealed by how he guesses. So this captive relation to something strictly impossible and incomprehensible creates a situation in which what is most mine is revealed as what is most true. Kierkegaard's Christology turns worship, we might say, into a form of automatic writing. For the Christian, Christ is this utter absurdity, the absolute exception. But at the same time, he's also, quote, the pattern. This is a phrase that recurs throughout uh, uh, training in Christianity and Kierkegaard's late works. And from the moment that one considers something that is the sign of contradiction also to be a paradigm, the offense that this contradiction engenders is transformed from a fact, which may either be doubted or believed, into a value, which may be cultivated or ignored. The follower of Christ turns the offensive truth of Christ's life into a pattern to be imitated. And this means to pursue offense voluntarily. Quote, the decisive mark of Christian suffering is the fact that it is voluntary. 
and that it is the possibility of offense for the sufferer. For when I voluntarily give up all, choosing danger and adversity, it is not possible to ignore the offense which derives from responsibility. Now the confusion of Christendom, according to Kierkegaard, is that it teaches that Christ suffered because he was misunderstood and that he collided with the established order because the established order happened to be corrupt. And the error of this view is that it makes Christ's offensiveness a kind of contingent feature of Christianity's relation to the world, a, a function of the fact that Christ happened to emerge in a corrupt society. Not so, Kierkegaard insists, the Christian God chose poverty. So the follower of a crucified God on this view imitates non-literally, focusing on opposition itself as the paradigmatic aspect of Christ's being in the world, not his poverty, but the oppositional element underneath that poverty. Quote, to be a Christian in truth should, be, should mean in the world, in the eyes of men, to be abased. And because Christianity is fundamentally a relationship of desire for Kierkegaard, it's commitment, responsibility, and will, this abasement cannot be equated simply with the event of losing the esteem of one's contemporaries or to the, uh, or to the fact of it, for, quote, when I lose all, there is no responsibility and there's nothing for temptation to lay hold of. So being a Christian means not to reject the world, but to employ the world, indeed actually to need the world, as that toward which one's conduct may be understood as offensive. Piety in this context is defined as responsibility in the face of temptation. And temptation requires the production of, quote, an endless, an endless contrast between the Christian and the worldly. An endless contrast between the Christian and the worldly. That phrase was precisely the phrase that set off the dialectical theological appropriations of, of Kierkegaard in the 20th century, the production of this endless contrast. So by systematizing the relationship between faith and offense, Kierkegaard reclaims the secular world for Christianity, for modern Christianity, and, trend, and, and uh, interprets it as the site of an ongoing spiritual trial. In some of his other writings, such as The Present Age, Kierkegaard makes this point even more fully, um, arguing that uh, the Christian is not only responsible for being different from others, but also for being perceived as different, for the production, that is, of a secular gaze, which upholds this, different and trans this difference and translates it into public terms. The word he uses to describe this disposition is the incognito of faith. There's certainly a lot more to think about how all of this works in Kierkegaard's own thought and in his, and in his 20th century re reception. But what I want to emphasize in this context is that we have found here a considerably, considerably more vigorous argument for the theological value of offense than, uh, than the sort of defenses I analyzed at the beginning of this paper using Rose's remarks as a sample. That is to say, here it is not only that the truth merits defense even when or even if it appears as scandalous, Rather, to provoke criticism is understood as a part of what it means to be the truth. The truth that Kierkegaard was after, importantly, is not the same that the proponents of free speech within the ranks of Tito Verb or the uh, Danish People's Party are after. What they seek to defend is not the absurdity of Christianity, as Kierkegaard did, but the integrity of a Danish Christian nationhood and identity. In their own arguments, it's generally indifferent whether the religious character of this identity is described as an active and expressive one, so the welfare state as an expression of Christianity, or as a historical and genealogical one. That is, uh, um, Denmark as a monocultural state which happens to have roots in Christianity. And this difference, the fact that Kierkegaard would, vi uh, would have violently disagreed with uh, the, this application of his ideas, the confrontational theology used uh, to undergird cultural Christianity rather than, crit than to critique it has led some reflective observers of current debates in Danish religion and politics to invoke Kierkegaard as a potential ally in the critique of religious secularism, as many have begun strong critiques of secularism in, in cases such as the Danish one. Ever the thinker of exception, this line of thought goes, Kierkegaard might be invoked again as a corrective, a challenge to the status quo. But of course, this is precisely the, it is precisely the ambivalence of this theological relation to the secular, which I've been trying to highlight from the beginning, 
because the populists are already using Kierkegaard's ideas in this regard and have been for decades. The seemingly secular rhetoric of social unity geared towards an external critique of Islam and immigrants is always premised on the very disunity that they seek to eradicate. That is, it uses a Christian critique of humanism along the lines of Kierkegaard's to oppose its internal target, the so-called politically correct Denmark, a cosmopolitan elite which has been shamed into self-censorship. And this fear of self-censorship was the key. It was this fear, according to Rosa himself, which uh, which in, in his, in his uh, explanation of why I published the cartoons, that prompted the initial publication of them. It was also this fear of self-censorship which prompted the formation of the Society for the Freedom of Print, which was a Danish society uh, founded in 2004 with participants, uh, with some of the founding members being the two uh, black priests that I mentioned uh, earlier in, in the talk, and a number of journalists and politicians, and has now morphed into a kind of international uh, into an international uh, uh, society which gives uh, a, a SACO prize every year um, uh, to, to those who are upholding the values of free speech. And founded in Denmark in 2004, that is a year before the publication of the, car the cartoons, it was already a reaction to this fear of self-censorship uh, taking place within uh, the Danish political culture. So I, uh, stepping back a little bit, because there are some disparate elements in this talk. Um, I hope what I what I hope to have uh, offered you today is a picture that uh, that suggests a little bit in a little bit different terms the complexity of the relationship between the secular and the religious in the Danish context, and in one sense, um, what I'm hoping to show is is simply uh, is a negative uh, result in a sense that the rhetoric of European values or Enlightenment values or a kind of Western discourse which we're primed, I think, in many contexts to be suspicious of, to give a little fuel to that, uh, to that readiness and to suggest that really the Danish context operates in its own terms and has its own history that needs to be considered before we think of the decisions that are going on and the conversations that are going on in the Danish media in a way that's parallel to what's happening in France or what's happening in the United States, for example. But at the, another, on another side, I think there's, there is perhaps preliminarily a kind of positive um, a thought to consider uh, from all of these disparate materials, which is we, in many different contexts in the modern world, are heirs to, a in a very complex way, to Reformation histories and to Lutheran histories in particular. And one of the interesting things about Denmark is precisely the homogeneity of its Lutheran formation as, as a modern nation state offers a kind of condensed opportunity to think through some of the kind of fundamental tensions in Lutheran theology and how they work themselves out in the modern secular. And so in that sense, it can be an instruct instructive case to think about um, beyond the Danish context as well. I stop there. Thanks. Okay, so, uh, super. Uh, thank you for a, 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 a lovely talk. Very, very interesting uh, in my mind. Um, interesting because it fits nicely with a uh, emerging tradition in the scholarship of religion that points out that there is no such thing as secularism. Secularism uh, itself comes in many varieties and is problematic. And so you're taking it a step further and I think in a very provocative, fascinating way to argue that certain secular attacks on religion have themselves religious roots. And I think that's absolutely great. Uh, before I throw out three quick points, I've been given five minutes to give comments, so before I throw out my three quick points, I'll start with an apology, two apologies. The first is, I know nothing about Kierkegaard, nothing whatsoever. My father would say, entire libraries can be structured around what I do not know about Kierkegaard. Uh, so I'm not gonna say much about Kierkegaard. And my other apology, uh, and is a, is a sincere humbling apology, is that I am in my sense a social scientist, uh, which means that my interest, and I've written a little about the, the Danish cartoons and issues of blasphemy, uh, tends to be, because of my training, because of my background, in behavior less than in thought, and in social behavior as opposed to individual behavior or individual thought. So that's, that's where my questions are coming from. Um, right. Um, so here's some points, and they're not by any means criticism. They're really issues I'm curious about and like to hear your input. The first is, I, the, you're throwing out uh, multiple terms that are all circling around the same sort of, we can set the cloud of concepts. 
And that is um, words like, uh, here, do you want to make that? Sure. Um, so we've got satire, irony, yeah. provocation, yeah. offense, mockery, critique. And I'm wondering what the relationship between these is in Kierkegaard's thought, mm -hmm. in your thought, mm -hmm. maybe in Rose's thought, mm -hmm. like the editor who published the first one, and maybe as far as members of Fita Verita think about it. Mm -hmm. Are these all the same, closely related? Um, which of these were the cartoons trying to do? Mm. Um, this, this point, prompts you to analyze the cartoons. Yeah. Which I don't know if you want to do that. Yeah. So when, as I was going around the United States five years ago talking about the cartoons and their effects, one of my main deliberations was whether I should show them in PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up deciding along Peter Bert's lines that I could show them as long as I offended everybody in the audience. So I put a whole series of offensive cartoons up and then put those cartoons up. And, you know, at least that was an equal opportunity to offender. Um, so is that, a, is that an important enterprise? Ought you, in your line of scholarship, given your argument, look deeply at the cartoons and see what are they trying to do and how do they do it? Are they just simple, stupid mockery? I, I should say, by the way, if any of you have seen the cartoons, the first thing that comes to mind is they're not very good cartoons at all. Uh, most of them are pretty stupid. Some of them have a certain irony, and one or two may even be slightly ingenious. I, I like the cartoonist who's sort of bending over his desk, sweating profusely, because he's worried about what his cartoon is going to, right? There's a certain self-reflection. But I wonder if you're interested in sort of deeply analyzing the cartoons. Are they satire? Are they irony? Are they provocation? Or are they just bland blasphemy? What would Kierkegaard think of them? <laughs> Are they loyal to his tradition? In other words, are they truly designed to teach something? Or whatever the opposite is, and I guess the opposite is they're just designed to debase in a, in a, in a, in a useless way. They're nothing but abuse, I guess would be the opposite. Um, two more points and then I'm gonna shut up. Um, the social scientist in me would be interested to know whether the these Danes you talk of, mm -hmm. these Danes among which, among which a particular form of Lutheranism is pervasive, do they consider this exercise to have been successful? Which exercise? The cartoons? The cartoons. Did Rosa yeah. think that it was a no. success? Did Rosa think, you know, this provoked it, provoked it in the right way, and we achieved, what would the test be? Yeah. We taught them something? We integrated them? Who's them? Um, and the last, Thing I'd like to know more of, and maybe this is a point I should have made earlier. You're going from a Danish society that produces a, a product, these cartoons, and you're telling us about certain Lutheran traditions, and then about Tietebert, and then about Kierkegaard. And I'm wondering how pervasive these traditions really are in Danish. You've convinced me, and I hope you've convinced everybody in the room, that there is a pervasive Lutheranism in Danish society, that it is not by any means as secular as we would think. I think that's easily said. Um, how pervasive is the Tietebert philosophy and Kierkegaard's idea about provocation and satire uh, in Danish society? And I think it'd be really cool if you could give us some examples. Yeah. Beyond, because the cartoons are now the only case we have. Yeah. In other spheres of Danish life in which we see the, an irreverence or an effort to mock or critique in a constructive way. That's it, but I think the project is super cool and I learned a lot, so thank you. Excuse me, before you answer, is it only the youth who got to read the questions now, or is it for the audience? I, I, I think we're gonna get to audience questions after the response. I mean, these, these questions that you put could go on for the next four hours, <laughs> and then it, you know, answer yes. the, the first question. <laughs> So far, I just want to know for formal people how long I'm going to stay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, went to, uh, I was hoping for four hours, but I don't know. <laughs>
No, this I is call, the, I the call form of dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a form of dialogue. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly yeah. standard kind yeah. of form of dialogue. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, so thank you but for the, the response. But the more we chat, the more time goes. And uh, limit yourself to three hours or less. If you <laughs> and I'll try, I'll try. We have, it's so fun that we have quite a bit of time for audience too. So thanks a lot for great questions. <laughs> Some of which I it will be shorter because I don't have answers for all of them. Um, but I'll start at the beginning. So mockery, critique, offense, satire, right. These are, I, this is something I was thinking about. Are these the same thing? There are religious, there are Christian histories to many of these different terms, ridicule and mockery, the mocking of the figure of Christ, have, uh, have played various different roles in, in, uh, in the history of the Christian tradition. Um, and certainly in Kierkegaard's time, you asked me to sort of address different, the, different fac the different factions that I'm talking about, how, what, their, what their views of, are, are of, of these different terms are. In Kierkegaard's time, one of the, one of the famed episodes of his life is his own uh, having been maligned at the hands of a satirical cartoon, The Corsair. And some narratives of his life's work uh, function in such a way that that episode, that that mockery becomes the central and defining feature of his authorship. So there's the moment before the cartoons, before he's mocked, and then all of a sudden uh, the kind of aggressive, polemical Christianity that he advocates later on in his life, that we, from which we read uh, many different passages, is attributed to the influence or the, the, the sort of bad feeling that he had. It was really a, a kind of harassment. I mean, he was mocked in the streets because it was a very popular cartoon, so little school children would, uh, he, had a, he had a hunchback. So the cartoons really exaggerated this hunchback, and children in the streets would, uh, would, would kind of imitate him as he walked. And he, I mean, there was, it was a traumatic, it was by all accounts a traumatic experience. So what is his attitude towards mockery and his attitude towards offense? I, you know, I think it's, it's interesting to see that um, in the wake of that experience, he did take up this quite robust articulation of the positive value that offense has within Christian thought. Um, maybe, maybe we could call that a doubling down, a doubling down on the value of offense. I think um, there, there's a passage that I skipped because another word that you included in that list was blasphemy. There's a passage that I skipped where he talks uh, about um, where he talks about the uh, you know this seemingly strange and radical statement that Christ is intrinsically an offensive figure, and he says he anticipates the critique and he says this isn't blasphemy actually, this isn't blasphemy. It would be blasphemy to think about Christ the way that my fellow modern Christians actually think about Christ which is to think of him as this kind of sage, this wise teacher who dispenses wisdom on the Greek model of worldly wisdom. That's the blasphemous thing. If we want to avoid blasphemy, we need to encounter the offense. So there's a, there's a very counterintuitive relationship between blasphemy, offense, and mockery in that thought itself. In Rosa, I don't think he has any really consistent description of what might be the boundaries between offense and mockery and ridicule. We see a lot of times in the remarks that he makes or in those who are defending him a kind of a kind of hedging between the fact of offense, like I'm sorry that this actually offended these people, and uh, a retrenchment into a position that is, well, my intention was to criticize, which is a legitimate project, and the fact that that criticism happened to offend or happened to have the result of offense is a distinct category, right? So, so I think that's a distinct view and it's one that's very, from, from the one that I was reading in Kierkegaard's work and I think it's one that's pretty prevalent. Um, you move from in that, that question about the, these, this constellation of terms to a question you sort of pivoted, you asked, okay, so what about the cartoons themselves? Were they about mockery? Were they about blasphemy? Were they about offense? And sort of as a sub-question within that, asking me to reflect on, should we be reading the cartoons themselves? I, I confess, I have, I have a difficult time making sense of what they were, because they're partly that's quantitative. There's so much about them that thinking about what they were without thinking about the discourse or thinking about them as having some reality outside of that frame just seems utterly impossible to me. So, um, and I think, you know, that the, 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 what I mentioned early in the talk about the, the proliferation of chronologies in the works on the cartoons is in a sense a reflection of that. It's like, when did we start talking about these things and why? That's kind of the question. Like, when did they, when did they become part of public discourse? Not exactly when and in, under what conditions. 
Not, not so much, uh, you know, who were the cartoonists and what they wanted, or who was the editorial board and what they wanted. I think it's very hard for me to think about what they were, partially because you have 12 different cartoonists with 12 different ideas of what, how to interpret, uh, how to interpret that task. Some of them, as you mentioned, were self-reflective and kind of self-conscious, mocking the task itself, um, and and others were not. Um, I think it's easier for me to think not about what the cartoons were, but about the way in which their presentation was shaped by the paper, so Rosa's own editorializing, and also by a kind of uh, somewhat, somewhat misty, but nonetheless traceable conversation that was going on in the background already in, in, in Danish media about the, the fear that Danish papers were already self-censoring, right? And so what, what were the cartoons? Perhaps I think my, my, uh, my, my best attempt at, at, at undertaking that was going to a later point that you made, a, a test not only of Muslims, but also of the Danish press themselves, right? Can we, can we man up, as it were? Can we, um, uh, can we hold ourselves to this line of insisting on the value of freedom of speech when, when it's perceived to be something that's already implicitly under compromise? It hasn't been tested yet, but this was sort of, in a sense, uh, the test. Was this exercise successful? I'm skipping uh, a little bit. So was the exercise successful? It's that, that's, that's sort of how I understand the exercise. Less, less about Muslims, in a way, um, than almost directed initially at the Danish media itself. Then, of course, that quickly changed because the reaction on the part of Danish Muslims became uh, extremely uh, loud and then it became an international issue very, very quickly. So. What, whatever they meant to happen, um, in a sense, it's, it's, it changed. It changed very quickly what the cartoons were about, and they, they lost control of that. And Rose's monograph, The Tyranny of Silence, which is like it came out six years or so after the publication of the cartoon, th th that, is, that is really one of the themes of the work, which is a kind of attempt to reflect on what he thought he was doing and how very different that was from what had actually happened for so many of the people that were involved in his some not very deep reflections on how everyone has their own story, but this is really the lesson that he learned from that, is that his story is just one of the many stories about these cartoons, right? Um, so, uh, but, and, well, well, if, if, I, if, if we think about it as a test of the Danish media, and as a test that's being undertaken on the media on its own part, in a sense, to see whether they had, uh, had, had the guts to uh, do something that they felt that they were afraid of doing, it's almost self-defeating in a sense. Rather than successful or unsuccessful, it seems it seems to me a kind of self-defeating exercise because it changes the 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 terms on which it operates are 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 so different from from the terms on which it then has to go into a kind of defense. Like the conversation that issued afterwards was so much about. Um, about whether uh, the, the paper was, was being uh, anti-Islamic, whether they were being racist, whether they were anti-immigration. And I do think actually one of, myopic or not, one of their attempts, the, one, of the, one of the elements of the exercise um, was this kind of uh, sort of self-reflective um, uh, attempt to see whether they themselves had the courage to do something. So I think that, that shift that happened in, 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 in the reaction then and made it clear that this could not have been um, this could never have been a test for the Danish media alone, um, means that it could never have been successful on those terms. There's something like that that I would say about it. Um, but then, so, and, and I guess that sort of obliquely answers your question about whether it's important to look at the cartoons themselves. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I think that the story is less about them than it is about the self-interpretation of the media that produced them. Um, and then final, this final question, also very difficult. How pervasive is this set of examples? You've shown us that the Danes are Lutheran, which we knew anyway. Um, you've shown us that Lutheranism has a problem between secular and the religious, which we knew anyway. Um, so how pervasive is the discord, this hardcore discourse of offense within 20th century theological discourse and 20th century Danish culture. Okay. So Kierkegaard is a running theme throughout the Tidehoek publication. So it, there are articles about him 
There are articles that interpret the work that I just read pieces from from you today. And this, as I think you see the uh, slide where you see his uh, title, you'll see that he positioned himself as the editor of this work and, and not its author, the editor being this, this person called Anticlimacus. Anticlimacus is really, uh, uh, he did not not sign the work in order to hide his authorship, but uh, it's, it's a kind of uh, character with a point of view, and he's also the author of another of Kierkegaard's famous works, The Sickness Unto Death, and that the point of view, the coherent point of view that is attributed to this particular character slash author in Kierkegaard's work is the, the is, is kind of his attempt at charting out what the best, most coherent, most extreme form of Christianity would look like. So in a sense, what Anticlimacus repre represents is Kierkegaard's attempt at concentrating and condensing Christianity as it would be described by the best Christian he can imagine. And that figure, that <laughs> Anticlimacus figure, became very important. So that vision of Christianity that he uh, promoted became very important very widely in, in, uh, in, in modern Danish culture um, in the sense that it kind of represented the critique. It represented really the critique, the relevant local critique of a secularized Christianity which had become the norm in Denmark. So this kind of opposition that I talked about between Grundtvig and Kierkegaard, that's a kind of, it's like two founding fathers of the religious culture of modern Denmark. And Anticlimacus is the best, most concentrated expression of that Kierkegaard in that, con in that, uh, in that opposition. So you'll find his name, this, the, this, this kind of farcical name, Anticlimacus, sort of uh, uh, thrown around in Tiedemann's publication. They, the publishing house has devoted uh, essays on Kierkegaard, and there's a long history of interpretation to which, uh, of an uh, interpretation of Kierkegaard in which the founding figures of, of, of the movement um, were sort of big figures in the, in the in 20th century interpretation of his work. Whether specifically the thinking about a sense is something that they would identify as a core element of the way in which they approach, for example, this issue, I don't think so. So I don't think that you know they're reading training in Christianity and saying, right, this is why we're doing what we're doing, and this sort of it helps us to explain it. It's more, in a, in a sense, uh, what's, uh, it, that he represents and can, is, is repeatedly invoked in many different kinds of contexts. Some of them are theological, some of them are sort of secular academic, some of them are more popular and journalistic, mm -hmm. is invoked as a form of critique of Christianity that might help get out of the entrenched secularized, secularized Lutheranism that is prevailing, right? So he represents this kind of voice that might offer a form of critique. So there's a confused way in which the person who has claimed that uh, Christian at the essence at the at the at the at the center of Christianity is something offensive, and to be a good Christian is to hold to that line. There's a confused way in which that seems to appeal to some uh, as a way of. Uh, as a way of criticizing the form of Christianity, which ironically has sort of written itself into the basis of this problematic Danish Christian fusion uh, within, within the modern secular sphere. And so in a way, I think it's, it's talking, about, uh, talking about this text and talking about this pretty remarkable defense of religious offense is trying to undermine the role that he might play as a kind of useful exception to this norm, and to try to reinscribe him as someone who's kind of forgotten as part of that, um, as part of that normative uh, Christian discourse in the 20th century. Um, would what would he think? You asked me also, what would he think of the cartoon? I I don't know. I, that's I. I, mean, I people in this audience probably have read Kierkegaard. I want to that I want to that I want to that I want to that I'm going to think about it while people ask me other things that I want to sort of open it up at that point. But thank you. I hope I've done some justice. All right, thank you. So let, let's open it up for questions. We kept the room very cold to keep the questions fresh. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, unless you want, otherwise I'll just call on yeah, people that's in great. order. They, so do you want to start? Um, let's say Bernie Sanders is the Democratic candidate for president. Okay. The first thing that's going to happen is anti-Semitism is going to raise its ugly head in the United States. Cartoons, I mean, 
that would be different or not different? Well, what I'm getting at is we all hold certain things, or most of us hold certain things to be sacred, whatever they are, okay? And most of those things can be lampooned in a vicious way if you want to really try hard, okay? And uh, some of us like to do that, but um, that's what Facebook is for. But um, I'm just wondering if, you know, it's usually cast in terms of Muslims have thin skin, right? Mm -hmm. But if the things that we hold were most sacred were attacked in the same way, how would you feel? So, um, you know, that, that gives me an opportunity to say something about, the, I mentioned quickly, you know, the, that there is this period of role, 1940, Danish, that the Dan Denmark occupied by the Germans, which gives this seeming kind of like aesthetic oppositional movement a curious relationship to nationalism. Um, because it becomes a kind of rallying point. Um, Danes as the underdogs in that, in that case, right? And so um, I, I, one, of the, one of the interesting things about Denmark is in comparison with some uh, of, its, of its neighbors is that uh, it, doesn't, it has a colonial consciousness, but it's a colonial consciousness that operates in a very different temporality from, the one from France, for example. So, Rather than in the 60s in the wars of self-determination and sort of the rise of the rise of self-determination, uh, having sort of reluctantly re relinquished its claims to colonial the, to a colonial project, it was more as as that ad that I that I quoted for, from you. You know, we lost our lands in the middle of the 19th century, and so they've been sort of living with that loss. And there's a con there's less a consciousness of themselves as a colonial nation, although that does happen with Greenland and other. Uh, in other in other instances, but 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 sort of built into the moment of the definition of Denmark da Danish society uh, in uh, in sort of uh, in its democratic era in the late 19th century is a sense of it having been reduced, made smaller, um, and to some extent humbled by these things. And I think that 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 gives it a different relationship also to uh, European anti-Semitism than you see in Germany, right? Where if you have the, the resonance of a cartoon like this in Germany is very, very different, and the question that you're asking about uh, about specificity, whether this is about Muslims in particular, or whether Jews would would would, would that would that would that make us sort of react differently, um, um, I think would has has something to do in a sense. Um, I, I'm re I'm shifting the the term of the the terrain of the question from the question about the specificity of Muslims to the specificity of Denmark, but but I think that there is something in that colonial history and that sense that. Um, we've been the underdog, we're a small country, we're not a big <coughs> colonial empire, we've been reduced, that creates a certain sense of, um, this is not a statistic, what I'm about to say, um, <laughs> that creates a certain sense of acceptance with regards to the idea of, of a, a kind of critical identity or a, what might be perceived as an aggressive or an ostracizing identity. Those two things go in some sense together. Uh, let's see, I think Jane. Yeah, yeah uh, I should say, uh, first, uh, I'm a Dane. Great. And, uh, what I'm have I done to you? Uh, strong <laughs> and religious studies. And uh, first of all, thanks for a very interesting talk. I thought you had, uh, I mean, it's definitely right that we have uh, also our offense as we call it. Uh, but I would like to add the concept, the concept you heard, uh, and also maybe to complicate the picture a bit. Actually, there was another crisis in the 70s in which Danish embassies were also burned in Europe uh, because of religious mockery. And uh, you had this uh, artist, I think we could call him Jim John Thorsen, who uh, wanted to make a porn movie with Jesus in the main role. And this became kind of a media stunt. Uh, and, and he, uh, and also a 
picked up the money and he continued the show and I think Danish embassies in Rome and Madrid were burned sometime in the 70s. I haven't had time to look it up. So I think that it's not just Lutheranism. I mm. think there is a general culture of religious mockery. And I think if you look at the 20th century Denmark, I think Marxism has played a really, really important role specifically because we had a movement uh, in Denmark, intellectual Marxism called cultural radicalism or cultural radicals. And they go back to a figure uh, called Joel, uh, Bill Hunters, mm -hmm. who also was influenced by Kierkegaard. So I think we may be onto something, but if you look at the 20th century and look at its debates on teaching of religion in schools or Marxist teachers, I, was, I had a teaching in religion in which the New Testament was taught through Freud and Marx and so on. So, on. so that's really what has been thriving. And it's also been allowed to be there or uh, what did the world does say. So I think it's a really, to answer around to your question, it, it is a really broad phenomenon and it's, uh, it's really pervasive. And also, so this, I guess, kind of shocked the Danes that all of a sudden you couldn't get anyone to draw your pictures of this Marxist or Britain, you couldn't. And also, I had a colleague at the University of Copenhagen who was a Jew, but he <coughs> taught Islamic studies. And he was abducted, beat up in a truck, and so forth uh, two years before he took suicide. So I guess what they wanted to do, as far as I understand, was go try and see what happened. Yeah. I mean, it's not, nothing necessarily deeply, just what happened. So I think that it's, it, it's a really broad phenomenon. my eyes with the whole 20th century at least. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very helpful uh, broadening. I think the, the way in which Marxism enters into the pedagogy and the instruction and the institutional culture of Denmark is a really interesting uh, kind of pairing to think about how a, a sense of the definition or the, the boundary between the secular and the religious is constituted and precisely that kind of that kind of critique would be really uh, it's a really helpful uh, it's a really helpful suggestion. Um, I think uh, it, it it also makes me think what you're saying um, um, of um, uh, you know the question in terms of the question of whether they were successful. I think the shock element that you're describing is also really important because um, you know the the, did this work? Did it work as a test? We'll do it. We'll see what happens. Did it work? It's also described as you know, a kind of um, uh, the biggest uh, foreign policy crisis that Denmark has seen in, in decades. And, and so it, it didn't work if what working is going to mean is doing something positive for the relationship between Muslims and Denmark, Danish society, and the broader culture of the West more generally. But this, this culture of offense that you're describing, the, the, the Marxist culture, I think, you know, I, I don't want to too much say that everything we're looking at is Lutheranism, but, but it's true that there, there's a really interesting relationship between um, the kind of, like what I, what, I, what, I, what I meant by putting up some of those, Luth those quotations from Luther himself is that precisely that idea that we can critique anything, right, the, the sense that um, it's an equal opportunity offense, or the sense uh, that just it's about mocking sacred things more generally, of which the Torsten case is is, uh, is sort of an instance. There, there is um, a relish in that, and in a sense, what I was trying to get it isn't so much the motivation behind the people who were drawing the cartoons in particular, or even Rosa's own idea. I don't think he's really part of the kind of theological ge uh, genealogy that I offered here, but. What, but the way the kind the culture of but under but looking at some of the um, the the lines of the culture of offense um, uh, from a Lutheran genealogy that I think actually that would be expanded by the Marxist case but maybe not excluded in a sense yeah thanks um, I'm trying to remember what the order was what 
I remember a talk that Habermas, who we met at night, a German philosopher, had with our German Pope once. And he said, he was very big, that concerning religion and expression of religion and the sacred myth, he has not has the ear for that. Mm -hmm. Society has lost its language and ear for the so called sacred and it so far does not know what it really does. On the background of the one saying concerning Christ, love your enemies. That is my question to you. I, you know, I think that your point if I understand the thrust of it rightly, is really in line with one of the things that I was thinking about at the core of looking at some of these materials, which is, and it goes along with, with much of the research that you mentioned as well, which is trying to think about, um, think about the problems in the way we understand the secular. Thinking about the problems in the way we understand the secular is also tantamount to admitting or putting into question the impression of what we understood to be religious to begin with, right? So, um, and I think that it, insofar as this new direction in the study of religion, of which I'm a very, very tiny, tiny piece, um, is partly motivated by rethinking that boundary or rethinking that distinction, um, what it is admitting or premised on is the sense that the rhetoric of the secular of which Habermas, his life gives us a kind of minuscule example of this kind of discovery because he started out thinking that he didn't have to think about religion and then here he is talking to the Pope and admitting, wait, maybe I do and how do I think about religion, right? Um, and what I, what I think is that the, the premise or the, the, the idea that that, that new direction is, is, is acknowledging is that there, there's a kind of collective amnesia that has set in in a number of <coughs> modern Western cultures. In America, I think, is, a, is an example of this. Um, and I think in certain places in, in Europe, I think certainly in France, is another case of this. It's like we don't know what we're looking for when we're looking for religion. Are we looking for the things that Muslims over there are doing? Are we looking for the things that the Jews here are doing? Are we looking at the people who go into our churches <coughs> on a very not very regular basis? Because uh, I think if that's the thing we're looking at when we're looking at religion, um, then we think we know how to do it. But if we're looking at for something of what people hold sacred or the ways in which those uh, bonds are articulated uh, in ways that traverse so-called confessional belonging or explicit religious participation, which is something that I was trying to sort of explore in this paper, then I think that that's right, that, we, that, that, the, that, that that's, part of, that's part of what's on the table today is to rethink, in a sense, how we might look for religion in the secular. Thank you. in that, and I, I think that there is a national 
people's present discourse about about uh, the long COVID crisis as well. So the national. Or have you thought of that? Is yes. That's my question. So, but so the the question is if that is absolutely something I was thinking about, and what struck me as strange about Suza, that's mm -hmm. like the closest I can get, but it has it takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, is <laughs> is is what struck me as strange is for anybody who knows the dialectical. Uh, uh, theological stuff in Germany, uh, it would be so strange to think of it as a nationalistic movement because it's precisely the confessing church, which Barth is a part of, which was opposed to the German uh, nationalization of religion uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the 30s and signed this great confession that was sort of resisting um, that sort of um, uh, uh, incorporation of uh, of, uh, of the church, of the national church into, into uh, national socialism. And so in that context, it's an anti-nationalistic movement, right? But in the Danish context, precisely because of the occupation, but this is, this is what, this, is, this, this gives me a chance to talk about the Grundtvig uh, comparison as well, because it, be, it became sort of ripe for the, the growth of nationalistic sentiments. And in that context, though it started very opposed to Grundtvig, it actually incorporated a lot of elements of the kind of um, the folk religion or the folk identity, the identification of a, of a, of a kind of folk identity in, in, in Denmark and a nationalistic identity um, uh, with the church. It incorporated that element, which drew it closer to Grundtvig. And so that's a, that there's a, there's a really, the, the, the kind of um, relationship, it's often, it's almost always talked about as an opposition between the two of them, Kierkegaard and Grundtvig. Like they're two almost in a sense ideal types, but the actual fact of both the Tiedehoff movement and um, the Grundtvigian movement is that they're both playing with these two sides, the aesthetic and the humanistic, in slightly different proportions, but nationalism plays a role in both of them. Um, so I, I, it's, something, it's, something, it's something to think further about, but I think you're absolutely right. Thanks. Thank you for your beautiful speech. Uh, I think if you excuse my bad English, uh, I w wonder uh, if I understood good uh, the uh, the expression of uh, cartoons and caricatures in Denmark are uh, in the uh, way of a legacy of a sort of Christian Danish. Uh, Kierkegaard uh, way to, 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 to permit uh, the offense as a Christian legacy. Uh, in France, as you know, the things are very different. Uh, at the first, for Charlie Hebdo, uh, it started with uh, the reproduction exactly. of uh, the Danish yeah. uh, caricatures, cartoons. Uh, they, they were not very interested by Mahomet, uh, the driver to caricature uh, Catholic, uh, but uh, uh, they, they, they act uh, uh, as a free speech uh, uh, defense. Yeah. And uh, how do you explain the difference of the uh, cartoon and caricatures uh, expression with French philosophy because oh, yeah. you, you seem to yeah. you seem to know, I'm not going to do the same know it very well. in France, yeah. And uh, because it, uh, in in the f mainly uh, general opinion in, in France, uh, the legacy is the legacy of the French Revolution, yeah. which is uh, is you don't care about yeah. religions. You can do whatever you want with your religion. We are not offended by religions, but don't be offended by uh, the possibility uh, to criticize or just to to to, to caricature it uh, in a sort of free speech expression, and maybe in just a sort of a pleasure. Thank you for that very difficult question. Yeah, how is France different from Denmark? <laughs> So, you know, Hebdo reprinted the cartoons in 2006, 
and then they were the subject of a hate speech lawsuit, which it was not successful, but that, that lawsuit drew so much attention to the paper that they also became more entrenched in the idea of republishing and defending it. So it's, again, it's a kind of, uh, it's really, this, this phenomena is so much a media phenomenon because it's about the response to a certain kind of response and the way that the attention is being drawn to a certain kind of response and that creates the conditions for the paper who's published them in the beginning, maybe not exactly knowing what they were doing by publishing the cartoons, let's see what happens. Then all of a sudden their intentions become clear once it becomes clear what happens, right? And I think that there's, there's a little bit of that and that Bill was, um, was like the first, as far as I understand it, it's the first sort of semi-serious paper to uh, publish, not serious in the sense of not humorous, but having a kind of intellectual repute um, because Francois uh, published them first and then only when Hebdo published them that everyone sort of, that was the floodgates in France and so the republication became a much uh, a bigger thing. I don't think that the cases that I'm describing, um, the, the history of dialectical theology or the role of a certain idea uh, of, of a kind of aesthetic, uh, aesthetic valuation of offense in Christianity is going to help explain what's happening in France. France, you have liberalism in a very different context. There is a relationship between, um, there, there, I read some interesting papers on, on, the, on the comparison between someone like Durkheim, um, who's really kind of thinking about the, not necessarily nationalism, but liberalism, and they, he say it was at the root of a lot of thinking about the role of religion and uh, in a liberal, uh, in, in, in the French state, and Brunswick, who's doing a kind of parallel kind of work in 19th century Denmark. There's, there, there's an interesting comparison, but the, certainly the, relig the presence of religion, the kind of religion, the, his, the political history, uh, the fact that France is dealing with colonial issues and has its immigrant population is there for different reasons, has a different understanding of their belonging or not belonging to French culture, all of that is very, very different. So I really wouldn't import any of the kind of specific history that I was telling about Denmark to France. And that's actually part of the stakes of the project in a sense is to, to because uh, precisely because there's this quick link between Jelansposten and Hebdo, but I think that the situation is really very, very different. The cultures are very different. And so to talk about both as examples in which free speech and Islamic sentiments or Islamic uh, offense are being sort of worked out is a real misunderstanding. And, and that's the drawing out that specificity was part of what I was trying to do. Well, uh, I'm confessed also, I'm a Danish. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> confessing Danes. I'm a professor of church history at oh, the wow. University of Copenhagen. And I've really enjoyed your talk. I think you are, uh, I also think that you really are to something. Uh, but I have uh, real one small comment, uh, and I will follow on yours, that the two though is a very small fraction. Oh, I wanted to say the, something else about the uh, card. Yeah, yes. and, and, and in addition, I'm sure you are aware of this, but there is a large difference the early two that yeah. when they started out in the uh, 1926 before World War II and then uh, what it turned out to be or how it developed uh, and especially with regards to politics mm -hmm. that is uh, one thing where you can really see the change so the early two that was much more close to fixing to Biden than the uh, modern politicians but uh, and also you should be uh, you, you mentioned that there are decided which things that should go viral. Um, uh, but I would like to um, uh, turn attention towards this uh, element of Lutheranism, which I think you are uh, right to bring up. And uh, it is um, so that the, sometimes in, uh, in church history, people regard Denmark as just some kind of northern province of Germany with regards to Lutheranism. But, uh, and it's a standing debate within uh, church history or not. And of course, as a Dane, I think that's uh, not true. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the areas where you can see that is one of the things that you uh, point to, because uh, it, whereas a lot of co uh, conservative Lutherans in, in, the, in between war period and uh, during World War II, a lot of conservative Lutherans were very positive towards Nazism, that's not the case in Denmark and Norway. 
last, the last comment you're making about, about uh, the interpretation of the secular within a Lutheran, uh, a, certain, a certain strain of Lutheran thought of which Kierkegaard is the exponent, yes. is precisely what I was trying to suggest or just gesture at with the, 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 the selections from, from Luther that I read. I'll come back to that. But so no, I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a very relevant question. Okay. So the small fraction, which I didn't say something about in several different, yeah, absolutely. It's a small but like so. It's a small but loud fraction. I don't know what to do with that, right? Because if you do, if the, some polls will say the, the the representation that they have in the media that they have, in, even in politics and certain kinds of votes, doesn't isn't necessarily reflected in some of the polls that people are taking about their actual opinions towards immigrants. So there's a there's a disconnect there that popular opinion doesn't actually seem to be reflected by the politics of the populist party, right? Um, uh, but, at the, and, but, but, and, but at the same time, I think there has to be a way of thinking about what the presence of this discourse is doing as loud and as much attention as it's gotten. And I think one of the distinctive things about the 2001 election, um, as far as I understand it, is the first moment where there wasn't, there was the, the, the sort of center right and right parties had gained such a majority that for the first time in decades, it was the first time that there wasn't a center, a left-right coalition formed. And so you could have these voices all the way on the right suddenly start sounding very familiar and taking a huge presence within public discourse uh, about immigration. And so, so that, that changed, in a sense, the volume and the amount of microphones that were given to them, though it may not have actually changed the number of people who agreed with them. And I think you're right to push back on that. Um, Differences between early and and and, and contemporary Stevenson, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, there and there there have been you know there have been books written trying to work against the rhetoric rhetoric that contemporary exponents of this theology have made that it hasn't changed. We're the same as where we always were. This kind of conservative rhetoric about the, the integrity of the program and the integrity of the movement, and people have sort of argued against that. But there is this sense that they want to appropriate in an edited way. The very beginnings of the movement and uh, and understand themselves in a kind of in a kind of in integral way. For me, under as, uh, where I am in my understanding of the development of the movement, it's really uh, the occupation and after the occupation that provides the first sort of big transformative context um, for that ideology to to, to shift, and then also uh, sort of the immigration uh, 70s 80s waves and the reactions to that and the way in which. Um, the way in which uh, certain uh, theological arguments about the welfare state were sort of marshaled to make sense of what was happening um, uh, with the sort of new wave of immigrants and, 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 and the problems that they were causing. But this big question you're asking at the end of your, uh, uh, of your, of your comment about, about the secular, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's, I think that's, that's the feeling that I had gotten. And I, I haven't fully worked out all the, the details of it, but it's, um, <coughs> But it's exactly what he's saying there, right? Which is, for us, the secular is this thing that I'm going to use to fight the Turk so that he can't touch my religion, right? I'm not in a religious war. I'm in a secular war. My religion is saved from that because that's part of the, you're using the word relative, but it's part of the secular. And the secular is, in a sense, the world created or the rhetoric or the rubric created to initiate, to, to, to protect that difference, to protect that difference. And so I think in that sense, um, it's important, it's interesting to me, it was very strange to, to republish this text now in, uh, in, in, the, in the context of what's happening. And it represents, um, <laughs> it represents a very clear way of affirming a Lutheran religious thinking about the integrity of the secular and the use of the secular for a Christian project. So that I, I'm, I'm affirming what you're saying, and I think it's 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 key to what I was hoping to think about. Thanks. Yeah, I think we have time for one uh, question. Uh, thanks for your uh, presentation. So I, you know, um, it's not the focus of your your paper, but I have questions about. Uh, Um, the a right not to be offended or a right? The right to be offended. 
So you know th this idea that there's a self censorship, uh, there's a fear of self censorship. So we're gonna uh, go through this process of a test. So you're you're thinking about well, what group are you gonna test this against, and how is that gonna be differentiated? So what the state is doing ultimately is also differentiating different parts of its my, you know population. So you know so there's a hypocrisy around how some groups are tested, other groups are safe from being tested. That sort of thing. But the larger question I have is that inscription into the nation of a proper subject in Denmark is about someone being, oh, it's, in, it's symbolic or it doesn't really mean much and we're not offended, then you're the good citizen or you're creating, like what is that doing? Is that creating a good society? Is that creating a proper citizen? So that's one part of the question. And what, what, what happens to the right for people to be offended, right? Um, and to, to work within their legal rights to be offended and, and, and express that. Right, so when Rasmussen was um, approached by the Muslim community in Denmark, um, they they prop they followed all the proper procedures, and he says, "I don't interfere." And they showed him the history of him interfering. For example, the chocolate Jesus exhibit the year before, the big, and all those things. But and and the other thing is, he did interfere. He gave the apology when it, it you know ethics didn't drive him; it was economics. Mm -hmm. So when the boycott like that, happened, yeah. that's when the apology came. Right, so it's it's a, it kind of raises questions about the right to be offended, um, and also personal injury. Like we read we we read the cartoons as a certain kind of blasphemy. What about just injury at, at a personal level that it, that we don't read them religiously? Um, so it's back to uh, Ron's point, you know, about um, you know what if you were looking at the cartoons and you're like, yeah, they're offensive, but not just because they're religious. They're offensive for all sorts of other reasons testing of a minority or, so the re I, I think you guys may have seen the cute video that just came out a couple of days ago that Denmark put out about don't be, uh, we're, we're, we're nice people, it's yeah. a very cute video, but it raises questions of maybe people just see it as wrong. They don't want to test minorities because they've had it hard enough. They don't want to take away their dignity or whatever it is, right? It's a, it's, that's the context of this video that just came out. So what if you weren't even going to use religion as a framing uh, and just say, look, it's just not a nice thing to do. Like black white relations in America or something. I mean, what if you what if you didn't think about this as religious, just personal injury? I think you can't. That that's certainly that. So some people I've uh, some people have pointed out, I think rightly, that you know if you look at the way, and this is a, this is an argument for reading the cartoons themselves. If you look at the way the figures are drawn, there are racist stereotypes. There are big noses. There are things. There are things that are associated with a certain negative visual stereotype of a foreigner or someone coming from an Arab country. And so they're circulating in tropes that are not, the, that are not only about religion at all, certainly, and are about um, the ostracization of, of minority communities. So I think that's, that's a right way to, to lar uh, broaden the frame um, uh, that wants to make this all about Islam. Mm -hmm. I think that is also part, in a sense, of the question which is wh which we're asking about the secular and the, I've been trying to ask about sort of a Danish Christianity, a Danish Christian fusion, what's the relationship between the Christian element and the Danish element and the national culture and certain traditions or, 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 or um, uh, liter even literary traditions of satire you might say. So what are the relationship between all of those elements and throwing a little more light onto the religious element was part of the stakes of my talk. I think perhaps a parallel kind of work, it could be done very productively, looking at um, at the side of the reaction and 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 reducing the extent to which religion is used as a function to understand, you know, Luther Luther's insistence on the Turk, right? Why the Turk and not the Muslim is part of a reflection of the fact that there's no distinction for the Turk, the Turk, the Quran, the Muslim. It's just it's all the same problematic mishmash of secular religions, right? It's we who have that distinction, we who have those clear lines, and so I think. I'm not saying that I think because Luther said that, that's why the media in modern Denmark is, is making that distinction, but it's, it's another example of that indistinction with respect to Islam that I think is important to pull apart. As a, the, the right to be offended, wh what the role of that is in, in, uh, um, in, 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 a, in a democratic culture, better, better, better scholars than I have done work on that subject. So Sabah Mahmoud's piece in the, in the collection that I mentioned um, is, is, is a great example of thinking about the ways in which 
offense is legible in a secular democracy? And I think that's that's the right question to be asking. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you for an excellent paper and for feeling so